Uh, so my name is Olga and I'm one of the founders and the CEO of Pandora Core Company. And uh, we have been building layer two and three technologies that would enable scalable smart contracts and AI on top of Lightning Network and Bitcoin protocol. In Bitcoin itself, I'm probably from 2018. Uh, because yes, I did fell. I I come from neuroscientific community, and I did fell for Ethereum's promise of scalable supercomputer that would uh, train neural networks, build uh, some crazy stuff. Uh, then I got uh, then I survived through that, and uh, now I'm I took this another pill, and currently I'm building technologies and products on Bitcoin and Lightning. Finally including RGB. Um, Maxim? Yeah. Uh, my name is Maxim Marlowski. I've been to Bitcoin since 2014, early 2014. Originally in Ukraine, I was one of the co-founders of uh, Bitcoin Foundation there. Uh, we've done some work trying to bring awareness about Bitcoin into the government, national bank, and uh, get through that. Uh, unfortunately, it all led to the fact that uh, basically these days government trying to use blockchain technology to build some sort of um, control systems. And uh, I'm not very happy about that. So since 2018, uh, me and colleagues, we started this project, which we named Pandora, uh, with the aim to to to, to do a death let off stroke to censorship and to concentrate on technologies that distributed technologies that uh, and distributed protocols uh, that can actually end up uh, censorship in such fields as uh, not just money because we already have partially solved problem with Bitcoin, but uh, more about computations and later with storage, high load computations, including like training neural networks. Uh, so the company became quite an uh, engineering one with a strong uh, value background. So we being big proponents for personal sovereignty and uh, such concepts. Cypherpunk concept. So we were trying to build a stack of technologies and we started actually with Ethereum. And uh, that was uh, a mistake which we decided understood later uh, because basically it's really hard to do something censorship resistant and scalable with Ethereum and there is many other problems. I wouldn't be talking about them today. Uh, and to build those protocols, uh, we actually needed, uh, we, we tried to start do, doing that on Bitcoin. And we were quite successful. We created a protocol we called Prometheus for distributed computing. We have a scientific article about that. Uh, however, to, to move it to the next stage, we need more. We needed more advanced system. And that's where uh, my, my friend actually those days, Jaka Mazuko, he was working for RGB. I will give a few notes how the RGB started. And so uh, I asked him a bit more than a year ago uh, at that moment, RGB was revived, and basically I became uh, a tech lead and engineer for this new iteration of RGB project. And right now, uh, we created uh, an organization which we named LNPPP as a standards association. LNPPP is standing for Lightning Network Protocol, Bitcoin Protocol. Uh, so the idea is that using Bitcoin and Lightning Network, we can recreate censorship resistant internet with all necessary layers and technologies that allow you proper communications and so on and so forth. So this organization is basically uh, supervises development of technologies, layer two and layer three technologies on top of Bitcoin and Lightning Network. And RGB is the current main project that we are uh, building, basing on that organization. Uh, the RGB started well, I, I don't know, probably it's for introduction, it's all, and RGB will be the next topic. Sorry. Yes, we're still here. Andrew? Yes, um, let's go into the RGB protocol. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So I can dive straight in. So the idea, uh, original idea of RGB came from how we can do an assets on Bitcoin in a proper way. 
because uh, what, what means proper way? First of all, we don't need uh, to issue new token and do an ICO, that's obvious. The second, uh, we don't need uh, to mix all the layers into layer one, like if you use it, uh, Turing complete languages, virtual machines, uh, storage, everything in layer one, because basically we will get unscalable system. And we wouldn't be able to scale, blockchain doesn't scale, the layer one doesn't scale properly, so we cl clearly need something that would scale. Uh, it must work with a Lightning Network, and it must work natively with Lightning Network. Uh, then it uh, must be uh, focused on privacy, focused uh, from the day one. Because as we saw uh, with many projects, if you don't have a privacy initially, it's really hard to add it later. Uh, Ethereum have this problem again, and even those systems that have a privacy embedded, if the privacy is optional, like with uh, Zcash, uh, many people don't use it, and the value and the actual uh, anonymity set that you get is really, really small. So all these things we try to fix, and the original idea was, uh, so the idea of let's design uh, asset protocol for Bitcoin properly came from Chaka Mazuko. He was communicating for some time with uh, other people, and uh, especially with Peter Todd. And at that stage, Peter Todd, he had a few very interesting concepts, uh, one of which was uh, client-side validation. What is client-side validation? The idea of client-side validation is uh, simple. Let's move uh, the data outside of blockchain. And we don't need to have a global consensus so all nodes agree on everything in the world. For many things, and including assets, uh, we have uh, the data that has to be validated only by owners. And with Bitcoin blockchain, we have a consensus layer already. So if we will put just the commitments into Bitcoin blockchain, and we can do that without taking any footprint in terms of size uh, of Bitcoin transactions, not adding any byte of data, I will tell you a bit later how it's done. Uh, we, we put just the commitments to those data, and the data are kept by the actual owners of the assets. This is a not a new idea. It's basically the same as before the digital world. There were a lot of uh, popular concept of bearer rights. So you, you are bearer of your rights. You bear the paper that certifies that rights, and with the client-side validation, you bear the data that certify and prove that you have some assets, your owners, ownership of something. Uh, so this is how RGB idea came, and it's being developed by Alecos and uh, a number of contributors uh, for more than a year. Uh, unfortunately, the idea and development a bit faded until it happened that in Malta there was a meeting and a number of parties, including uh, John Kawafa from Blombit Retail, including uh, Paolo from uh, Bitfinex, uh, again, Giacomo, uh, Oleg from, from Fugur Ventures, they had this interest. Let, let's do the, the asset protocol for Bitcoin world. And they revived the project. Bitfinex and Fugur Ventures became one of the main sponsors for the project. And so that's the point where I joined in. We created this association and the development was revived. Uh, we, we, we took basically the idea of, um, of client-side validation, single-use seals from Peter Todd, the, the concept that's being developed, and advanced uh, the system much farther. So uh, first of all, we added uh, confidentiality, zero knowledge, uh, including uh, such things uh, like uh, Pedersen commitments and bullet proofs, which are most efficient range proofs uh, comparing to other alternatives. Uh, we added uh, ability for the many assets to interact. And the most important thing is that we basically converted the system from just an asset or color point version into a properly generic digital rights management system. Mm, so basically it's a smart contract system. And the system will support, for instance, simplicity as a scripting language. So we will have a pretty much, when it is combined with Bitcoin transaction script, 
we have pretty much a smart contract system that is capable of uh, delivering uh, what was pre promised uh, by the blockchain technologies, all those generation, second, third, and fourth blockchains, but on top of Bitcoin, scalable, outside of blockchain itself, working with Lightning Network, confidential from day one. So uh, that's what RGB is today. And right now we have a complete on-chain part, which is being released as a beta version, uh, but uh, it is uh, basically working for on-chain part of the protocol. And we are finalizing the Lightning Network integration. So hopefully uh, throughout the, till the end of the year, we will have the system uh, shipped and working. Probably that's all for a brief introduction. That was fantastic. Maybe Olga would like to add something. Yeah, maybe just to emphasize that uh, a lot of people still think that uh, RGB is just like assets, assets on Bitcoin or assets on over Lightning or something like that. Um, oops, we did we did it in a way that uh, RGB has become really something bigger, and it really has become, uh, as Maxim said, a, a whole new smart contract system and right right management one. And uh, it really, really does open a lot of different possibilities from, uh, you know, um, decentralized organizations, uh, management of funds, and even AI and neural network computations. So yeah, that's like my five cents. Can you can you give us an example? Because you said it's it's more than just a tokenized asset, right? Um, and and you you kind of briefly mentioned two of them, but could you dig a little bit more in depth into like what else it enables, like the extra stuff? Like it's not just a token asset, but what else is it? Because I'm still having a hard time understanding practically like what that would look like. There is a few examples of other things that you can design. Uh, first of all, for instance, you can design identity systems. Uh, second, you can design. Um, uh, things for basically everything that was promised with a blockchain and smart contracts this can be created with rgb the only thing that uh, it's not the case that you need uh, that you need uh, to uh, use smart contracts everywhere as they being popularized that they are like unique solutions for everything no they are not unique solution for everything they are solution for very particular types of problems. And the first type of that problem is different forms of assets, fungible, non-fungible assets, not only tokens. Uh, we are talking about such normal things like shares, uh, like bonds, like any kind of securities that can be just digitalized with this pro protocol and acquire a censorship resistant secondary market. Uh, which is very important. After that, we can talk about building a digital identity and reputation systems, not in a way where you have some sort of uh, authorities. In a way, or in a way you have decentralized digital identity, but it's not really truly decentralized and it's not uh, really censorship resistant. Uh, here, you can connect different facts between themselves and prove that connection only when you need to expose something, some sort of part of the history and still remain the rest of your history, rest of your identity completely private and still checkable if you provide that. So uh, the, the, other th the other case that you can use is a reputational systems for, uh, for, for the markets, for decentralized markets. Another another thing uh, where I mean reputation is something that you can't sell, you can't uh, transfer to other party, but you can prove that you have this particular uh, amount of, of reputation. So it's not properly, it can't be named actually as a token. Uh, anything else, any other form of rights, like ownership rights, which can be digitalized, also can be used with uh, uh, RGB and basically with a smart contracting system. But of course you trust the point when you link the physical world with the digital world, there will be a point of trust which actually provides that link. And the last thing that I can mention is, uh, uh, let's name it audit log. Uh, 
it's the, the main case for the enterprise excitement about blockchain, like supply chains, healthcare, and all the other that stuff, which is, I think, it, it is a hype, and in most cases is not needed and over-promising. But what you can actually do is that you can create a unique, uh, provable history of some records. For instance, uh, if you have a medical hospital and you have a patient, and the patient come to you and you do medical records and you have a history of those medical records. Uh, and for instance, something bad happens and there is some investigation on why it happened. Uh, you, you can forge the history. And if you need an affordable history, you can for sure put uh, timestamps into blockchain. But this wouldn't work if you will just do as timestamps. Because you can, for instance, in each case, you can create two alternative timestamps and then reveal just a single one, depending on the one that you are interested in. Like, uh, if somebody asks you, will I have a boy or a girl? You say that you have a boy, you will have a boy and write both, both options. You commit to both options and then just demonstrate the one. Oh, no, it was, here is the commitment. There is a girl commitment. So you can't prove that there is no alternative commitments, no alternative timestamps. With RGB as a system, you can connect them between themselves and create a provable unique history, meaning that the, you can prove that there is no and there was no alternative commitments and uh, no alternative history. And this history can be verifiable and provable. And more, even more, this history can be bearded uh, as a bearer right by the actual client of the hospital. And uh, the hospital can't fake it and it can be transferred. And it is the person who owns the data, uh, which has this data, and they are not keep kept by the hospital itself, for instance. So there are many cases in the uh, other cases in the enterprise world that can be built around this concept. So a uh, quick question. Uh, yeah. So where is that commitment stored? Because in Ethereum or whatever, that uh, information is stored in a smart contract or is stored in like data in, in the blockchain, right? For RGB, yes. Here, where is that stored? You don't store you don't store any, anything in blockchain. You uh, store them as a binary data of special format defined by RGB protocol. You store them yourself and you create special types of commitments called single use seals uh, into Bitcoin blockchain. Meaning that you basically taking hash of this, we name them state transitions, unlike transactions, which you have in the blockchain world, in the client side validation world, you have these small state transitions and you, you, you compute hash of that state transition. And then when you, you create a Bitcoin transaction, a normal Bitcoin transaction, maybe you would like to transfer Bitcoins or, or something and uh, you add this hash to the public key, to one of the public keys inside the transaction. And it changes the public key into another public key. Okay, so it's basically a tweaking procedure. And this public key looks like any other, and it has the same size and same footprint. So from the outside world, blockchain analysis tool or miners, they don't see that there is some commitment in the transaction, that they are unable to guess that. But those who have the client side data, they are able to validate those data that they are unique and correct. Does that mean it takes uh, 10 minutes for there to be a transaction in using RGB? Yes, when you work on chain, but the same way it works with the lightning channels. So with lightning, you will have those speed of lightning. Okay, so that must mean that the commitments are recorded in channel updates in some shape or form? Yes, uh, the commitments are going. So the system work with Bitcoin transaction graph. And uh, meaning that it can be implemented on top of any kind of Bitcoin transaction graph you are trusting to. So if you are trusting Bitcoin blockchain and miners, you use on-chain transactions. If you have a channel, lightning channel, you can use that. Uh, the internet broke up in the middle of the last portion. Could you kind of recover, oh. recap the part with the lightning commitment transactions with RGB to where you just ended? Yeah, so really briefly, uh, the system, RGB system, works with any Bitcoin transaction graph. And we call it commitment medium. So you can use Bitcoin blockchain as a commitment medium. You can use a lightning channel. You can use a state chain or a side chain 
or any possible future technology that uses Bitcoin transactions, multi-party lightning channels, lightning factories, uh, VLCs, uh, atomic swaps, whatever you prefer to. And it doesn't require to be modified to use RGB. Uh, you just need to integrate it into the software. And RGB, again, doesn't need to change to work with other layers of Bitcoin transactions. Great. Um, so if I want to verify um, for myself, right, uh, like the that like a transaction happened um, or something changed, do I download an RGB client and I can check that myself? You will need an RGB enabled or integrated wallet or exchange or, or software, any form of software. And when, uh, basically, initially you're not an owner. And let's assume that I'm sending you some assets. Use the tether or some shares or some company or some voting rights or whatever. And uh, you have a wallet, RGB enabled wallet. You create an invoice, give it to me. And uh, after that, I'm sending you the data, binary data, which are named consignment. Basically, my wallet sends it to your wallet. Your wallet accepts those data, validates those data, and displays that now you are an owner of this state, of these assets, of these rights, of voting rights, of shares, of something. And after that, you can transfer it further. The most important part is that I would know very little about you, and uh, you will know a very little about the previous history of RGB, but you will still be able to validate it. So, for instance, when you are talking about amounts of assets, of shares, of coins, uh, it is always a confidential amount, zero knowledge, so you don't know who were the previous owners. And those who haven't received this assignment, uh, this consignment, and it's also basically, I'm sending you this data. And there is nobody in the world who has those data other than you and me. And they wouldn't know anything about uh, this transaction between us. Um, how would it be possible to keep track of um, tokenized assets? So for example, in Ethereum, you create a contract address. And so in that address, you can keep track of like how many transactions there are, uh, how many coins were created and things like that um, uh, through yeah. an explorer. Is that something that you'd be able to do with RGB or um, is that not possible because of the privacy aspect of it? Right, so uh, what you can track with RGB uh, is uh, the amount of issued assets. And this can be tracked because the issuer he can publish those data to prove that he haven't issued more than a certain amount of the asset. But even without that, the fact if the issuer will, uh, when he creates a genesis, he commits to a certain amount of maximum so total supply. Or he says that there is no total supply cap, so he doesn't create the commitment. And each owner of that asset will check up to the genesis that his history doesn't include any extra issued assets. So each owner is able to check the total supply and that he is still below this limit. He is not, otherwise he wouldn't just accept that asset because it. it's like, oh, it overflows the initial issue of promise. Got it. The rest of the world, they will know the total supply only if the issuer will publish those data. Got it. And nobody in the world will know who are the owners and what is the real distribution of the asset. Um, another question I had is maybe more about the censorship resistant part of it, right? So I understand yeah. how if I transfer my asset to you, um, we know, right? But um, what if like a, a government comes and he says, and they shut down both of our clients, like what happens to that asset? Does it completely disappear? Or, or what happens if some, the government tries to shut down the owner of the asset, the person who created the asset? What happens to uh, the token then? If uh, the issuer, you mean, or owner. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm not sure what the difference is, but yeah. Well, the issuer. Uh, I think your question the... mentioned both. So the question, the question mentioned both. The first case is where we, as two owners of uh, some asset, get shut down, or our facilities get shut down. And another case is when the person who actually 
created the asset and created the chain assets, he got shut down. Shut down. I think that, that's yes. what yes. Yeah, or, or the, you're welcome to answer that part. If you'd like. Oh, come on. You are doing a good job. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, if the issuer is shut down, uh, it doesn't affect the secondary market of this asset. No how. So the owners are still the owners, and it will affect the obligations of the issuer. For instance, if it is a company shares, uh, and the company was legally shut down, of course the value of the shares will disappear. But it's like it's not protocol specific. It's the economy how it works. Yeah. Uh, but you're still able to trade them. You wouldn't be able to lose your ownership of those assets. Uh, if you as an owner, your infrastructure got shut down, until you have those data, a copy of those data, you're still the owner. It's like with Bitcoin private keys. Until you own Bitcoin private keys, you are the owner of Bitcoins. If you lose Bitcoin private keys, you will lose your Bitcoins. The same with the client validated data. Until you keep this data, you are the owner. If you lose them, you are not the owner. The happy part is that if somebody find them, Unlike private keys, they wouldn't be able to take your ownership. The ownership in RGB is also uh, defined by Bitcoin layer one, by Bitcoin private keys. So with RGB, you have two different things. The first is what defines the ownership rights. And these are Bitcoin private keys, the same as you use to keep Bitcoins, the same private keys you use to keep your RGB assets. And the second, the actual assets and the proofs about that you are the owner of this asset. So with the private keys you spent, with this you prove that you own them. And again, if uh, this client validated data are stolen, it doesn't affect your ownership. If you lost them and don't have any more, you lost the asset forever, like with the private keys. And for sure, if somebody is uh, taking by force your assets, the protocol can't help like with Bitcoin, so. From right. a physical force, it's impossible to protect, unfortunately. This is, this is so interesting to me because it's, it's different. It's a different model. I'm trying to think through, um, yeah, I'm just trying to think through the system a little bit more, but it's very, very interesting. Um, I, I'm gonna open it up to the group. Uh, does anybody have any questions that they'd like to ask? Um, the Pandora team. Uh, this is Damien. I've got a question. Um, yeah. yeah. It sounds like um, it sounds like, and correct me if I'm wrong. Um, it sounds like, um, say you have a piece of real estate that you tokenize, and you make ten tokens out of this piece of real estate. Um, this gets this real estate gets sold as an asset to. 10 different uh, Lightning Wallet owners. Um, it sounds like uh, the entity that tokenized the asset won't know ultimately who uh, holds the token. Um, it, it, well, actually, I have two questions. Do they know who holds the token? Because those tokens could be sold on to other people. It sounds like there's no central repository of, of knowledge. No, thank you. No. Of like, is, is is that correct? There's no central repository of, of knowledge. There is no central repository of knowledge until you would like to create. Right. Until right. Until you say, hey, you raise your hand and you say, hey, I I own uh, this token, um, and you kind of make some uh, you make some database that sits outside of. of um, yeah, but as an issuer, you can require the declaration of the ownership. Right. Um, my other question is about how how many um uh it sounds like but i just wanted to confirm there will only ever be 10 of those tokenized uh if i tokenize that piece of property there will only ever be 10 of those tokens um like there's no there's no duplication or anything like that um like there's only ever going to be 10 of them well as an issue again if you commit to 10 tokens and right. then issue 11 token uh nobody will accept it from you because those party who will accept that they will see that it is 11th token uh, while you committed only to 10 and nobody 
will accept this levels token from this new owner. So he wouldn't accept it from you as well. It's it's that uh, it's interesting because like is that um it, that it, it it sounds like how, how does how did how do you know that it's an eleventh token? Like how do you know that like um, because we're only dealing with state uh, channel changes? How do you know that um, the how do you know if there's like a fraudulent token out there? Well, if you would like to issue the tokens into Lightning Channel, then you will need a multi-party Lightning Channel. Uh, because if you issue them, you can exchange them with the, only the other parts involved in the channel. But what you can do, you can issue the channel, uh, the tokens on chain, and then use them and put them into different Lightning channels. That's the other case. Mm. And in that other case, you in both cases you will know the total supply because each time you're receiving the data, you track the whole history from your token to the genesis and you see how many tokens were created on that route because you have those data and you can compute those tokens interesting you have the data but you don't have identity data right like yes right okay. and you don't you actually have zero knowledge data so you do this computation in a hidden way you, you just see that the value doesn't match and you don't accept that okay so that's interesting because that's something i wasn't aware of before Assets, RGB assets on Lightning only exist within multi-party channels, and so... No, 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 no. Okay. No, no, no. Uh, if you issue the asset, you have to do that on-chain, unlike there is a multi-party channel, because it doesn't make a lot of sense to issue the asset into a Lightning channel. Yes. Because if you issue the asset into a Lightning channel, you can use this asset only inside this Lightning channel. It can't get up. But if you issue it on chain, you can distribute it across many lightning channels and lightning network because each of the channel can verify against the issue that happened on chain. That makes sense. Yeah, it acts as an anchor. Yeah. Wow. Um, so, yeah, there are some questions. Yeah. HJ uh, asked, how far is RGB and is it ready to be used? Uh, we have a whole protocol designed, and we implemented the whole on-chain part. So right now we have an RGB node, uh, which can be integrated and ready for integration into mobile wallets, servers, and uh, desktop software, exchanges. For end users to use RGB, you actually will need some wallet, because we as a LMP VPS association, we are not developing a wallet and client software. We develop a technology. So we are not repeating, I wouldn't say that a sort of mistake, but like with Bitcoin Core, they're trying to remove wallet from Bitcoin Core today. So the RGB node, it's not a wallet node. It works with any other wallet, with the Bitcoin Core. And uh, to use RGB today, you need some wallet developer to integrate it into wallet, and then you can use it throughout this wallet. Right now, at least uh, three or four teams working on uh, wallet integration of RGB. I can say about deadlines, but I think that we will have some beta version in a month or two for one of those projects, or maybe even a few of them. So uh, the developers, they can use on-chain RGB today, and they should, if you are, they are interested, they should start integrating. Uh, the end users will be able to use RGB when the wallets will be out. Hopefully, month or two. That's a like no no test that because I wouldn't advise to put real value into yeah. those tokens at this phase. And uh, the lightning part uh, again for the developers, it will be ready within a couple of months during the this year till the end of this year. Um, and it sounds like another question this person had was uh, yeah. You know, does it work with other chains? I'm going to assume no, because it seems to be a Bitcoin native project, although they can probably fork it, right? Does it work with the changes? Oh, so, with uh, other chains, with altcoins, like Namecoin. Well, I have no idea. I, I never tried. So I assume that uh, you can potentially integrate uh, RGB with Bitcoin-like coins if you need to. But uh, I wouldn't advise doing that. Yeah. 
Um, another question is, um, somebody asked that Voltero, it sounded like Voltero was working on a native token based on RGB. Um, or do you have any updates on this? Uh, they had plans, but uh, I, I, I'm not by part of the Voltero. I don't know how these plans have changed so far. Got it. Um, yeah, we have, I, been talking I, with, we have been talking with Voltero team for uh, months, I can say. Uh, just keep updating each other on their plans, on the plans and everything like that. But uh, currently, as far as I know, they have some other priorities. So we're just we're in touch, but not not actively like integrating. But yeah, probably you need to ask Josh on that. Uh, another question and, is um, okay. regarding the demo and everything. I can post links to uh, the YouTube where the RGB beta demo is demonstrated and to RGB node in case you need to just catch up with the progress. Very cool. Uh, another question we had is, how far are we away from seeing an easy non-command line interface that allows people to create NFTs with RGB protocol? Well, NFTs are probably first a question of uh, schema because currently like every asset that can be issued on RGB is it comes from using a schema currently we have schema for fungible tokens, and we are still working on unfungible one. Uh, I'm not sure about the deadlines, though, and also non-common line interfaces for that. Uh, as, as RGB team, we are not working on interface part at all. It's up to the business to develop their products and to, to build the wallets, to build the usable interfaces. Otherwise, we wouldn't just have a time. Pandora, the company that uh, we actually run, we have a team there uh, which we asked to help with the developing uh, wallet for RGB, but uh, I, I wouldn't commit again to the, 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 the line on this user interface part right now because, again, our, my main focus and all the main focus is uh, RGB development, the, the core protocol and organization of Lightning Network. But as I said, I hope that we will have a user interface friendly a wallet within a month, two, or something like that, because it's not only my company, we have at least three other teams working on the interface uh, user interface based uh, wallets. And non fungible tokens, um, it seems that uh, the initial release of wallets will support uh, both fungible and non fungible because we started with the idea of having two schema for fungible and non fungible. And now we uh, will probably start with a more with more generic schema. So there will be at least four or five schemas for different types of tokens, including non-fungible, and they will be shipped as a part of the initial version altogether. So I assume that non-fungibles will be, maybe I'm not sure about how they will be useful to the mobile wallet interface, but clearly they can be at least listed and transferred uh, there. Um, could you briefly speak to um, the who's involved with developing RGB now? Is it just Pandora? Uh, no, we have a, a community contributors, uh, quite a few of them, and uh, we have uh, we we had Alekos Pilini, who was originally working on the initial uh, implementation of RGB, and he gained he then he moved to Blockstream. And after that, he was also working on the implementation, helping with the implementation of the current version. And we have at least uh, two other uh, full-time developers that are helping with that, uh, working for the LNP DP Association. So basically, the LNP DP Association is the body that governs the development of the RGB. And it's just like, because I'm from Pandora and Olga from Pandora, that's why Pandora is being involved, but it's not like everything is streamed through the Pandora. We have, first of all, open source community, at least probably more than 15 contributors in total to the code and parts of that. Especially at the level of design, we have huge contributions from the community. More than we had a conference coming with more than 20 people coming there and to people from Lightning, like Lynette Card. Christian Decker gave a lot of suggestions. Uh, we took in a lot of concepts and ideas, and we had a discussions with uh, Adam Back, 
because the confidential assets are influenced many parts of RGB design as well. Uh, and uh, Max Hillebrand from uh, Wasabi Wallet uh, in Bitcoin, which is an Italian company, and many people from there, like more than five people, done a lot of contributions. Olga, maybe you can also add to that. We have actually the list of contributors a bit outdated on the RGB side on GitHub. Yeah, so uh, in LMPVP organization in GitHub, you can see 19 people, but again, it's a personal, uh, personal things. We have, uh, like, in addition to what you said, uh, we did have, and we do have uh, one guy who is actually trying to make a business regarding to uh, electricity and the distribution of electricity in Italy. That's one person. Uh, then, yes, we have a bunch of people from in Bitcoin. I think there are like three or four of them. Uh, we also have one like Rust God, I would say, who did a lot for us and he's doing a lot for reviews currently. Uh, his name is Martin and he works uh, not for Parliament Police, but uh, with Parliament Police, I guess. And yeah, he's a very good guy. Uh, by the way, if anyone wants to learn Rust, he has uh, a workshop or something like that, and you can reach out to him. He'll just keep you updated on how things are working with Rust. Uh, Peter Todd, of course, and uh, a couple of guys from Copenhagen, uh, from, yeah, even... The hyper Division, yeah. Yeah, the Hyper Division guys. And uh, of course, a couple of guys that work for Bitfinex themselves. So overall, I would say it's around actually 23 people, but just not all of them are there currently. And um, you said that there were three businesses. I think Pandora is one of them that's involved. Um, who are the other two businesses that are involved? The, the other one is uh, John's, uh, John Carvajal, who oh. moved from uh, from uh, Bitrefill. Okay. And he, he created a new startup. Uh, I don't know, is it publicly announced? Probably, probably not. Or not. Yeah, but not yet. He, he, he is working on that, clearly, and he has a big interest. The other one is uh, Bitfinex, of course. Got it. Which are... Very interested in bringing USB Tether, and they have a couple of other projects that are based on RGB. So these are the, the main three businesses. But other than that, uh, we have a, a lot of communications with our world developers. It's just they don't invest a lot of time and effort right now into integrating, but they're clear, clearly investigating and uh, trying to play with the RGB. Very cool. Uh, do people have any other questions? Um, let's try to wrap this up within the next couple minutes. Um, I've got one more question. I've got a couple more questions. Anyway. Um, um, the uh, let's see. It seems like you guys are drawing, uh, and, and I should draw a distinction between fungible and unfungible tokens. Um, what are the differences between those two things? Well, uh, the, the difference is basically a normal difference. There could be one token of non-fungible uh, thing, and there could be many tokens of, of fungible. So you can think of non-fungible as a each case of fungible tokens when you have issued just a single token. So is 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 like a fungible token just can be fractionalized? Is that the idea, or because I'm thinking? No, no, no. CryptoKitties is a non-fungible, right? Um, well, it's quite simple to understand. If you have a painting and you tokenize this painting, you have only one painting of that kind. So basically, it is non-fungible. If you tokenize, for instance, uh, some printed material where you can print a lot of different stuff, you can you issue multiple tokens and they are fungible because you can like have two, three, five of them. And of course, it's about divisibility, but again, even with Bitcoin, you, you have Bitcoin and Satoshi. So in terms of Satoshi, Satoshi is divisible and Bitcoin is divisible. So it's not that about divisibility because divisibility is the way you count items, but it's about, about the issuance. So if you issue a unique thing, this is non-fungible. If you issue something that can be counted, this is fungible. 
So probably like the easiest way to uh, describe the difference would be non-fungible is art, for example, the painting as Maxim said, and fungible is like business shares of a startup that has seed rounds and needs to give up the shares, then he like precedes seed rounds, then series A and everything like that. And they need to reissue more and more shares or something and uh, share them with their investors and blah, blah, blah. Okay, so, okay. so like more assets can be added to that kind of asset set yes. later on. Okay. Yes. Um, the other question I had was, it seems like with this technology, um, it seems like the, the obvious thing to do is to create some kind of market on top, uh, using RGB uh, on top of Lightning. So I'm interested about, um, say we did like, I was thinking of it, uh, say we did like uh, our own version of CryptoKitties, it'll be Bitcoin bears and um, and it'll be on RGB um, and all of a sudden we have like a ton of uh, a ton of transactions running across lightning. I'm worried. I'm worried about kind of um, uh, network congestion and fees. Um, what do you guys think about that? Well, I don't think that in case of lightning network, the network congestion that fee can be a problem, even if you have a lot of transactions running there. So. I doubt that it will affect the, the, the number more. It's more positive thing that the Lightning Network gets more used. Why, why do you think that it could be negative for oh, Lightning I, I, don't, I don't have any evidence for this. I'm just, you know, um, uh, uh, network congestion and fees is, is just kind of like always in the back of my mind when it comes to anything blockchain. So. Yeah, on chain, yes, but, but the Lightning Network was created to solve that problem. So we will see <laughs> how it works in practice. Cool, thanks. Yeah, also regarding uh, Lightning Network, it actually happened that while building RGB, we also contributed a lot to Lightning Network development. And Maxim even had a presentation last fall in Berlin, right? In Berlin, the Lightning, Net, uh, the Lightning Conference. And uh, yeah, he introduced some issues that we tried to tackle and some of them we got resolved. So probably if anyone's interested, you can just uh, find that, that video on YouTube or ask me, I'll post the link. Um, one technical question about creating a tokenized asset on Lightning through RGB. Uh, let's, uh, I, let's say I created on chain. Um, is there a certain amount of time or blocks I have to wait before uh, that asset can start trading or being used? Because um, isn't it possible that there could be like a rollback of one or two blocks before and that uh, that transaction disappearing, basically? Right. Uh, with the issues, the genesis is not committed into Bitcoin blockchain because there is no reason to. You still trust the issuer. And... Uh, what is actually happens is that in Genesis, we, we name this assign, you, you assign the asset you issue to existing Bitcoin transaction outputs. So you already have Bitcoin transactions, you identify them by transaction ID and transaction output number, and you, are, you assign to specific transaction output certain amount of assets. So this all happens off chain and instantly. And this transaction can be mined at any depth of the Bitcoin. It can be created 10 years ago, for instance. And with this creating, by creating Genesis, you assign an asset to this 10 years old transaction output. The only thing, it shouldn't be unspent at this point of the assignment. So you don't need to wait any time. You just need to pick up the transaction output that you think wouldn't change. And even with the work, if you will be able to publish this transaction again, if it's not published right now, it is still valid genesis because this transaction can be published in the future, or that's why it's working with the Lightning channel, because you assign assets not to a block number and to some offset of the transaction in that block, but to transaction ID, which is independent from uh, the fact is transaction published in blockchain or not, and to output number. Um, yeah, okay, so that kind of brings me to, I, I think, one of my last questions. Um, uh, some some of the criticisms around RGB is, is, revolves around it being more trusted, I guess. Uh, a more trusted setup, a more trusted system than 
uh, let's say Ethereum. And I was wondering if you could kind of speak to that, if that may be true or not, or um, if so, in what ways? I don't see where it's more trusted. I think Ethereum is more trusted because uh, there you can, you, you basically have a censorship of miners, which is a proven historical core in Ethereum. And in terms of the issuers, in RGB, you trust the issuers. It, it is the only point of trust. And you trust them that they will fulfill the promise that they made with creating tokens. So it's not technical trust. It's like legal trust. So they made a promise. This token is represented by something. Like our company shares, so we will pay dividends, or this is a stable coin with some reserve. And it's not part of RGB technology. It's the fundamental part of the issuer. The same happens with Ethereum. You trust uh, the issuer that he will fulfill the obligation he has taken. And with Ethereum, uh, the issuers, usually the smart contracts are structured the way that they can be updated. And you trust that the contract, contract will never be updated to change the original rules. But it frequently happens. With RGB, the issuer have no right of updating contract. Once it's out, it's out. And he, it can, the issuer can change that. And the only party that can change the rules are the new owners, and not by consensus. But the owner can change the rules of the smart contract only for the token he owns, not for everybody else. So there is no government. It's a very anarcho-capitalistic, untrusted system. So you rule what you own. There is nobody else who can affect what you own. And uh, you can't, there is no voting for something. There is no governance, because any form of governance is the tyranny of majority. Here, majority can't decide something for the assets that you own, because nobody knows who owns the assets and which assets and where they are out there. But for the assets that you own, you are the only party, you know, the issuer who decide their future history. So um, I guess maybe people will say that uh, it's trust. It's a bit more trusted because um, it's not embedded in the blockchain. Um, it's more client side um, validation. But it sounds like to you, you're saying that um, all of this, when you issue an asset or whatever, or even when you move it, all of it is cryptographically secured. Uh, and updated, and so in that way, it's um, it's more, it's less trusted. With the, with the client side validation, you are who validates the data. Yeah, you can't with with blockchain. You can run a light client. You can not validate the blocks, but with client validated, you have to validate your data. So it's not more trust. Less. It's not more trusted. It is less trusted Got than. It blockchain because you, you you like you are getting your data you validate them well, what's the point of trust i there? think i think the concern like the actual concern here might be that uh everyone can issue like same same tokens or same things and you cannot people think that you cannot really uh trust all of those people who claim that they created something and you're not... But it's not about you're not, Yeah, You so can do the same on Ethereum. About, yeah, so it, A, it's not about the technology and B, uh, you are basically the validation node. Yeah. So you yeah, validate... You, you have to validate validate that verify you the only. data that you have. Yeah, so you have basically... To verify. Uh, regardless the fact that you... Sorry, Maxine. Uh, regardless the fact that you need to trust the issuer, you have the right and the an obligation actually to verify every information that comes to you and you can reject the assets and you can reject everything that comes and you are not aligned with it so yes there is still some point of trust but you validate everything that comes to you and you are totally in control of what you have what you own and what you pass very cool. The only point of trust in RGB is outside RGB. It is the issuer. And it is the same point of trust as with the paper shares or Ethereum or anything else. Because we, in Bitcoin, we are talking about money and there is no point of trust. Uh, but when you are talking about shares or assets, because we are not creating money on Bitcoin with RGB, we're creating assets securities and with the securities you always have the issue as a point of trust and then yeah. it is a false promise of ethereum and actually a lie 
that you don't need to trust an issuer in Ethereum that the issuer will fulfill his obligations. No. <laughs> he can yeah, update like the smart contract. Yeah, like in a real life scenario, uh, for example, if you are an investor of some company, then the company uh, founders, they can issue shares and uh, like you sort of in trust. Runaway. So you can sort of, you, you need to trust the people that you invest in, right? So yes, there is like normal life, there is this point of trust. So, but it's not RGB related anyhow. Got it. Yeah, a um, couple comments from Matthew Black says that in Ethereum, most assets issued have an admin key that can change it. With RGP, uh, you can verify who issued the asset and it can't be updated. And lastly, that Ethereum, you can whitelist, blacklist assets that are issued and that's not possible with RGP. Well, um, Olga, Maxim, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to have you. to chat with you guys again because this is super fascinating to me. And uh, I thank you so thank much for coming on. This has been super fantastic, super interesting. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks very much.